Okay, folks, quick reminder, next week is spring break. That's a good news. The bad news is if it's spring break, we're getting closer to the halfway point of this class than we are to the start of the class, which means a whole host of crap is going to come at you right after spring break. Remember, if you want to get feedback on your DCF, I think you need to get your evaluation done by March, the end of March, so that I can, it's not, it's optional, you don't have to do it, but I would strongly recommend that you get your intrinsic evaluation done, because things are only going to get more compressed as you get towards the end of the semester. So get the intrinsic evaluation out of the way. I would send you a more detailed email on a kind of a to-do list, so you have a sequence of the other things I need to do. Um, your quizzes are graded and ready to be picked up. So they're in alphabetical order still, kind of. People have moved a few alphabets around. So if you can't find those, just keep looking. Um, it's upstairs. And at the end, on Wednesday, I will take it back into my office because if I leave it out for spring break where it is, it'll probably get recycled and you'll never find it again. So if you want to pick it up, pick it up before Wednesday. So today we're going to complete our discussion of growth and kind of talk about a generic way of thinking about growth. If you remember last session, we were talking about analyst estimates of growth and how a lot of people in the value companies use analyst estimates because the assumption is they must know more about the company than I do. So I want to start with that question. Do they actually know more? And if so, can you use their growth rates and valuation? So Let's take analyst estimates, and I'm going to talk about using them in valuation. I'm going to tell you, you know, I'm going to make a couple, few statements, and you tell me whether these statements are true about analyst estimates. So these are problems in using analyst estimates. Tell me if they're real problems. The growth that you usually see on Zacks or on Yahoo Finance as the growth rate for a company, it's usually a growth rate in earnings per share of the company, right, as opposed to what? What you're trying to forecast is growth in revenues, a growth in operating income, so clearly a problem. The growth rate is generally highly correlated with historical growth. In other words, I understand to estimate high growth for companies that have grown high. No. You're saying, what's wrong with that? We talked about the limitations of historical growth. So in a sense, that's why analyst estimates do so much, don't do very much relative to historical growth. Problem? Yes. The growth rate is not a good estimate of future growth. This is the most damning indictment, right? Even if it's a growth rate in earnings per share, it doesn't do a very good job once you get past one quarter ahead or two quarters ahead. Also a problem. And finally, if you use an analyst estimate of growth as your growth rate for your company, my question is, what sense is this your valuation of the company? Now, think about what you're doing, right? If you put a growth rate in, you're essentially automating the process. Nothing wrong with that. But I could basically set up my computer to read the analyst growth rate, plug it into earnings, project out the numbers, do it. You're not needed. 
I'm not saying that in an insulting way. I'm just saying if all you're doing is plugging and chugging, it's really not your valuation. So all of those are problems, which is essentially an argument for, hey, when you value a company, don't tell me use 12% because that's what analysts are projecting as growth. If that's what you end up with, it's got to have more than that behind it. Today, we're going to talk about where growth actually comes from. Growth doesn't come from you and I endowing companies with growth. It doesn't come from analysts. It doesn't come from management. It comes from choices you make as a company. And not giving away the story. Here's what drives your growth as a company. How much you reinvest, how well you reinvest. So let's take a very simplistic example. Let's assume a company that's reporting 75 million in after-tax operating income on invested capital of a billion. So right now it's earning a 7.5% return on capital. And let's assume that it plans to invest nothing more and its return on capital is going to stay what it is today. So it's not going to reinvest from this day on. It's going to basically maintain its capital and keep its return on capital where it is without even knowing any finance, just in terms of math. What growth rate can this company have? Well, you're going to have 7.5% next year, 75 million, 75 million. In, in other words, your growth rate is going to be zero. Let's say simplistic. What are the two ways this company can go? One is it can add to the invested capital by taking new investments, raise the invested capital, and try to keep the 7.5% going. What's the other? Push up your return on capital from 75 to 9%. Let's call the first growth, reinvestment growth, the second growth, efficiency growth. They both look the same in hindsight, but here's the difference. If I just look at that growth rate, I'd rather have efficiency growth than reinvestment growth because it doesn't require additional capital being invested. So you think this is good, I'll go for efficiency growth. But there's a catch. If you have efficiency growth next year, I'm going to say, okay, that makes sense. And if you have efficiency growth the year after, I'm going to push back and say, you're getting really efficient. At some point in time, you're going to hit a ceiling, right? Efficiency growth comes with an ending in time. You can't keep, so you can't tell me your company will keep growing forever by becoming more efficient over time. That doesn't make any sense. Eventually, to keep growth going, you need to reinvest. That's kind of a summary of what we're going to talk about first today. So if I can raise my return on capital, seven and a half to 10%, you can already see what next, in fact, somebody tell me mathematically what the growth rate is going to be next year. If you reinvest nothing, but all you do is raise your return on capital from seven and a half to 10%. So right now you make 75 million, right? Next year, how much are you going to make? 100 million. You're going to have a 33.33% growth rate next year because you're able to improve your return on capital. So this isn't rocket science. When you look at a company and you project growth, you've got to tell me where the growth is coming from and how much you have to reinvest to generate that growth. So let's turn back to where we were in the slides. I think we were in slide 177 where I set up the reinvestment policy. But I'm going to kind of nail down this issue of reinvestment. And so how much are you reinvesting and how well are you reinvest? And I'm going to use a framework we've already talked about before. When you sit down to value a company, you have to make a choice. Are you valuing equity? Are you valuing the entire firm? And within equity, you can say, am I going to take the lazy way out of looking at earnings per share and dividends, or am I going to look at free cash flow equity? The way you think about how much you reinvest and how well you reinvest is going to be determined by the choice you make. Let me be specific. If you're looking at earnings per share and you're projecting out a dividend discount model, I'm going to estimate how much your reinvestment is by looking at the percentage of your net income that you put back into the business. You guys have heard of payout ratios, right? What is a payout ratio measure? The percentage of your net income that you pay out as dividends. So if I say the payout ratio is 40%, I'm saying your retention ratio is 60%. So think of the retention ratio as the percentage of your earnings that you put back in the business. That's how I measure reinvestment. If you ask me how well am I reinvesting, because I'm equity focused, I'm going to give you a return in equity. Net income divided by book value of equity. Keyword is book value. This is the only place in finance where you're going to see us use book values. Everywhere else, when we talk about debt and equity, it's always market values. When you compute accounting returns, we use book values. I'm going to come back and ask, why is that? Why the focus on book value? 
So with earnings per share, retention ratio becomes what you reinvest, return in equity becomes how well you reinvest. Let's move to free cash plus equity. With free cash plus equity, you're not assuming that everything you don't pay out as dividends gets reinvested. You see why that's a dangerous assumption? If I don't pay out something as dividends, I might be just holding it in cash. In the first approach, I'm treating it as reinvestment. So when you talk about free cash or equity, I'm going to be much more specific. I say, tell me what you actually reinvest. And I can measure that, right? It's going to be CapEx minus depreciation, net CapEx, change in working capital. And here again, think of everything we talked about with net CapEx, acquisitions, R&D. And then to the degree that some of that gets paid for with debt, you're saying, well, I don't have to come up with it as an equity investor. So reinvestment is now measured directly by looking at what you put back in the business and your equity portion of that is whatever you have to come up with as an equity investor. You divide that by net income, you come up with what's called an equity reinvestment rate. So pause and think about it. Retention ratio versus equity reinvestment rate, what the differences are. Retention ratio, you're just taking dividends as what's paid out, whatever's retained is reinvested. With an equity reinvestment rate, you're actually looking at what the company is putting back into the business. But there are two other dimensions on which pay, uh, retention ratios and equity reinvestment rates can differ. What's the highest number a retention ratio can have? What's the highest percentage of earnings you can retain? 100%. What's the lowest retention ratio you can have as a company? Zero percent. So retention ratios are constrained by zero and on. You say, who cares? It's going to matter. What's the highest number in equity reinvestment rate? Can you, can you reinvest more than 100%? Yes, by raising fresh capital. So already you're relaxing that constraint. You can say a company can reinvest more than its net income by raising fresh capital. Yes? How that come in the equation? it would show up in the, in the net capex and change in working capital being greater than the net income. So you might 50 in net income and reinvest 300, your equity, re net, equity reinvestment rate is gonna be 600%. Raise the so you will grow earnings, but you're growing it by raising fresh capital. You can't do that with a per share number because per share numbers, you're constrained by how, how you raise the capital. So already I've relaxed. Can your equity reinvestment rate be less than 0%? So what has to be true? Your numerator here has to be a negative number, right? So the question I'm asking is, can net capex be negative? Absolutely, capex can be less than depreciation. Change in working capital can be negative. You say, this is not good, I agree with you, but you can end up with a negative equity reinvestment rate. You see, what does that mean? If a company has a negative reinvestment rate in any one year, it could be an oddity. Something happened that year, but if you repeatedly have negative re equity reinvestment rates, what are you doing as a company? You're shrinking as a company. We're opening the door. That can be so already you can see with equity reinvestment rates, you get more flexibility. You can deal with really high growth companies or shrinking companies. You can't do that with retention ratios. And because you're focused on what you're investing back in your operating assets, the way I'm going to measure return on equity is going to be slightly different. Traditional return on equity, you take net income and divide by book equity, right? But net income for a company can come from two places. It can come from your operating assets, but it can also come from the cash you've accumulated in the company. I mean, you're saying, how much can I make on cash? The last decade, you didn't make much, but right now, if you have cash, you're making about 4.8%. That's a table rate. Anybody can do it. I could do it. I can go on the table auction. In any, if any of you have cash in your brokerage account, for God's sakes, don't leave it as cash. We got sloppy over the last decade because... The last decade, you made 0.1%. Who cares? 4.8%, you should care. So when you think about net income, some of it comes from your cash and some of it comes from your operating assets. And if you look at book equity, some of that equity is invested in operating assets and some of it is invested in cash. So there's a version of return on equity where you take the cash out of the process. What do you do? You take the income from, from cash out of your net income. So your net income will be net of that amount. And when you do your book equity, you net out cash from book equity. Basically saying, I'm focused on just, see why you want the, the reason you want to know the answer for this is you're trying to get a sense of how good are my operating projects? You don't want to get contaminated by the fact that you have a lot of cash earning 4% and draw the wrong conclusions.
So when you're focusing on free cash or equity, your measure of reinvestment becomes the equity reinvestment rate, and your measure of how good projects are becomes this non-cash return rate. But you're still answering the same two questions. How much are you reinvesting? How well are you reinvesting? Let's turn to free cash flow to the firm where you use operating income. Here, when I think about reinvestment, I'm not focused on how much of your net income is going back into the business. I'm looking at the percentage of your after-tax operating income you're putting back in the business. And here I'm looking at the total reinvestment, not just the equity portion. So my numerator becomes the total reinvestment, net capex plus change in working capital. And my denominator becomes the after-tax operating I'm staying internally consistent. I'm focused on free cash flow of the firm. I want to look at the percentage of my after-tax operating income that goes back into the business. Equity reinvestment rates and reinvestment rates share some common roots. They have no, no ceiling, no floor. But reinvestment rates measure the percentage of your total after-tax operating income that goes back into the business. And if I'm looking at the entire business, I no longer care about return on equity, right? I've got to look at the return I earn, not just on my equity, but also on the debt invested in the company. So the way I measure how well you're reinvesting is by taking the after-tax operating income, the income to all claim holders, and dividing by book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash. It's still book value, but I'm looking, that's called invested capital. You can already see that people are sloppy. I see people multiplying retention ratios by return on invested capital reinvestment rates by return equity. You can't do that. Consistency demands that you make your choice up front and define how much you reinvest and how well you reinvest based on those choices. So I know it sounds incredibly abstract. So let me take you through a few examples. So you, this is called a sustainable growth rate because essentially you're taking how much you reinvest and how well you reinvest and the product of those two numbers gives you the growth. I'm going to add a very important qualifier as to when you can do this. But let's go through some very simplistic calculations. The first one, I'm going to use the earnings per share approach. So then I was valuing Wells Fargo in, in, in 2008 around the crisis. So I'll give you a pre-crisis valuation, a post-crisis valuation. So you can see how these numbers affect your valuation. So when you're looking at earnings per share, retention ratio becomes a measure of how much you reinvest. Return in equity becomes your proxy for how well you reinvest. In 2008, just before the crisis, Wells Fargo was earning a return in equity of 17.56%. And this was a true cross banks leading into the crisis. They were all reporting really high returns in equity. We didn't know fully at that time that they were pushing the limits on these numbers. They were going into riskier business than they should, and the regulatory authorities were not catching up. So let's say in this moment of ignorance, I take that, that retention ratio of 45% and the return equity of 17.36% and say that's what they can keep doing in the future. It'd been a horrible mistake in hindsight, but in, in June of 2008, I'd have said, you know what? If they can maintain those numbers, my expected growth rate is going to be the product of those two numbers. It's about 8%. So in Valley Wells Fargo in June of 2008, I'd have used 8% as my growth rate in earnings per share per year. And if you asked me why, I'd have said, because they can maintain this return on equity and this retention ratio. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Let's say it's September of 2008, the crisis hits. And one of the things that regulatory authorities decided was they'd been too lax, that banks needed more capital to keep going. So in October or November of 2008, the regulatory capital requirements at banks was raised about 30%. Let's say you're looking at the Wells Fargo numbers from June, let's say none of those numbers have changed. The net income hasn't changed, the, the dividends haven't changed, but now the rules have changed, right? Because your book equity now has to increase by roughly 30% reflect. So what's a simplistic correction I can make even if I don't want to change the base interest? What's going to happen to my return on equity? My numerator would stay the same, but my denominator, I'll have a book equity that's 30% higher. My return on equity is going to go from 17.56% to about 14%. Even if I change nothing else, my expected growth in earnings per share is going to drop from 8 to 6%. Now do you see when you value banks, with the last bastion for the dividend discount model, why you care so much about what the regulatory capital authorities are thinking? Because if they make those requirements more restrictive, it's going to have an impact on your return in equity. 
by having an impact on your return equity, it is going to have an impact on your expected growth rate. So this is the most simplistic, sustainable growth model. It's been used for 50 or 60 years. People use it in all kinds of bad places. But implicitly, when you use this approach, you're assuming the existing return in equity is essentially going to be a return in equity forever. And if you're willing to make that assumption, this equation will work. Let's move, uh, so let's take a closer look at that return equity. So what pushes up your growth rate is having a high return equity, right? So let's say you're a CEO of a company and you say, you know what, I want a higher sustainable growth. I'm gonna to try to increase my return. If you break down return equity, it comes from two choices you make. In some cases, you can have a high return in equity as a company because you take really good projects. Apple has a 35% return equity because whatever invest makes a huge return. So the first way to high return equity is to take great projects. That's so much work and it's so difficult to do. So what's the second way you can pump up your return equity? Every real estate developer knows how to do this. What do you do? You borrow money. How does that push up your return equity? It reduces the equity invest and to the extent that what you make on projects exceeds your cost of borrowing after taxes, that difference goes to equity investors. So if you break down the return equity, you can actually break it down as return on capital, which is what you make on your base project, plus this leverage effect. And the leverage effect is going to be the debt to equity ratio times the difference between what you make on your projects and your cost of debt. So that's a minimal condition. You need to be able to make more on your projects and your after-tax cost of debt, but that's not asking for very much, right? Because the after-tax cost of debt, even with higher interest rates today, is like three to 4%. So almost every project will have a higher return in equity as you push up the debt ratio. You're saying, why should I care? You see why you should care? I'm going to take an example, this is late 90s. It's a Brazilian beverage company called Brahma. It's since been renamed as Ambev. It's one of Latin America's biggest beverage companies now. And it's controlled by the 3G Capital, this well-known you know, private equity group in Brazil. So when I first looked at Brahma, the first thing that jumped out me, they had a 31% return. That's impressive. But I wanted to dig to see whether that return in equity came from great projects or whether it came from leverage. So I first computed the return on capital. Return on capital, remember, is based on after-tax operating income and book value investment. So what you borrow has no effect on return on capital. It's a function of the quality of your projects. So if they took no debt on, their return on equity would be 19.91%. For every dollar of equity, they borrowed 77 cents. Their debt to equity ratio was 0.77. So they're heavy users of debt. And on that debt, they were paying an after-tax cost of 5.61%. Let's see what they're doing. They're borrowing money at 5.61%, investing in a project making 19.91%. That difference of 14.3% goes to the equity investors. That's a great attraction of borrowing money. So out of the 31% return equity, 19.9% comes from projects. The remaining 11% comes from the user. You say, why draw a distinction? What do we, when you use return equity to get projected growth rates in earnings per share and dividends per share and cash, what do we dis discount those equity cash flows back at? Cost of equity, right? So the way you're pumping up your return on equity is by using more debt, there's another shoe waiting to drop, which is my cost of equity for your project is going to be much higher. So the distinction between an Apple that earns a 31% return equity with very little debt and a Brahma that earns a 31% return equity with a lot more debt is even if they were in the same business and they're not. I'd use a much higher cost of equity for Brahma because I'd use a lever beta. This is the reason that we lever betas because it at least forces us to think about, hey, what will using more debt do to my cost of equity? So sustainable growth with earnings per share, retention ratio and return equity. But we talked about its limits, right? You have a company that's, you know, the most my growth rate can be with this approach is it cannot exceed my return equity because the retention ratio is 100%. My growth rate can't drop below 0%. And that doesn't make sense because we know companies grow their net income at much more than their return equity and often have negative growth rates. 
So to deal with that, I'm going to take the second approach where rather than focus on what the company is not paying up as my reinvestment, I actually explicitly measure what they reinvest. Yes, John. So how do you find the right balance between how much debt you take and how much you take? I and try different numbers, numbers, right? In a sense, you, you're sitting there with a spreadsheet. You can say, what if I, so both numbers are being driven by it. It's not, you know, you can see what will happen if I have zero. So remember last session, we talked about free cash flow equity and cost of equity and how that balance plays out. This is another way to find your optimal debt ratio. But here's what you cannot do. You can't focus on maximizing return on equity and say that increases my value of equity because maximizing your return on equity might come at a debt ratio that's so stratospheric that your cost of equity is also really high. So if nothing else, you can take the difference between ROE and cost of equity and look at how the difference changes as your debt ratio changes and look at what your tipping point is. Let's now focus on net capex change and equity reinvestment. The big difference here is you're now focused on what the company is actually reinvesting rather than what it's not paying out as different. So it's much more explicit. And there's no excuse for not doing this, right? You have net capex, they're all there. Why trust the company when they say, well, we've reinvested everything else? So the equity reinvestment rate looks at the total amount that you put back into the business, net of debt. And your non-cash return equity looks at what you will make on your projects if you focused on just the offering. So it's a, it's a different, more focused vision. And because you're looking at re reinvestment rates, you're no longer constrained to be you know, less you know, to be between zero and 100. You can have more than 100% or less than zero percent. So I'm going to try this again on a company, and I'm going to go back in time. You look at Coca-Cola, right? And this is without capitalizing brand name advertising. So it might look different. We, in fact, we can ask the question, what will the numbers look like if you capitalize brand name advertising? So I looked at traditional reinvestment in Coca-Cola. Just to give you a sense of reinvestment in Coca-Cola, you need some history. If you look at a beverage company, your big capital investment, if you're a beverage company, is not in the syrup, it's in the bottling plants. And about 40 years ago, Coca-Cola decided to spin off its bottling plants. So they're actually, if you try to buy shares in Coca-Cola, be careful that you're buying the right Coca-Cola. You can buy Coca-Cola, the beverage company, or you can buy Coca-Cola bottling plants. You know what this also means, right? They don't have traditional large amounts of net capex. And guess what? When I look at their, at their numbers, it reflects it. Their non-cash net income was about 11.7 billion. So what I'm doing is taking the net income, subtracting out the income from the cash balance. And it was tiny, 105 million. Their non-cash book equity was about 18.3 billion. It took the book equity, subtracted out the cash balance. Their non-cash return equity is 64%. That's astounding, right? But remember, I said I haven't capitalized brand name advertising. So uh, you know, I'm escalating the return on equity because I'm not bringing the biggest asset on the box. When I went to the statement of cash flows, it looked like that CapEx, this is the accounting CapEx of 2.2 billion. The depreciation was 1,443 million. So they're basically reinvesting about 700 million, at least according to the equivalents. And even we added the working capital change, the total amount reinvested is about 957 million. Saying so why are you subtracting out the 150 million? Remember, I'm looking at just the equity investors. So if 150 million of this is coming from debt, the 957. So if I divide the 957 million by the 11.7 billion, the reinvestment rate is 8.18%. So if I take those numbers as a given, 8.18% times 64% gives me an expected growth, which is not bad given the fact that they're reinvesting almost nothing of 5.22%. Now, Ed, help me out here. If I capitalize brand name advertising, First, what's going to happen to my non-cash return equity? <laughs> it's one of the two. <laughs> so somebody want to help it? So let's look at the effect of capitalizing. Let's say if I capitalize brand name advertising, I do affect my net income, right? Because I then add back the RMD and the advertising, subtract out the amortization but there's an even bigger impact on my book equity. Remember the unamortized portion of advertising, especially if you're looking at a 25 or 50 year life, is going to push up my book equity much more than my net income is helping. My return equity is going to go from 64% to maybe 25%. Still great, but, not, but much more believable. I don't believe that Coca-Cola is making 
So your return in equity is going to come down. You're saying that's going to be terrible. My growth rate is going to drop off. Not really, right? Because what else is going to change? My equity reinvestment rate now has to include advertising as part of my capex. I'm going to get a much higher equity reinvestment rate. You're saying, will the product work out to 5.22% you wish? Because if it worked out to 5.22%, we'd never capitalize R&D, right? Or, or advertising. It'll work out to a different number, but a number that I think is more believable as a forecasting number. And this is why we capitalize R&D and advertising. Because if you remember, the free cash flow to the firm is unaffected by those numbers. The free cash flow to equity is unaffected. You're saying, why did we waste our time? It's to get a better sense of what's a true return on capital or return on equity in this company. What's a true equity reinvestment rate? So any questions on how, so basically we're trying to do the same thing, we're just measuring it differently because we're focusing on free cash flow equity and non-cash flow Which brings us to the third approach to sustainable growth. Here's the most generic, right? You're trying to value the firm. Now you estimate reinvestment as a percentage of your after tax operating income that goes back into the business, no longer net out the debt, and you return on invested capital. Now, I, I want to say something. I use the word return on capital, return on invested capital, return on capital employed interchangeably. There are people who splice these differences. I've never understood it. So whatever you want to use, I'm okay with it as long as you stay consistent, use the same thing. This is return invested capital as far as I'm concerned. It's after tax operating to divide book value debt plus book value equity minus cash. And this is probably a good time to stop and ask a question. Why have we given up this fixation with market value when we get to accounting? I said this is the only place in finance we use book values. Why do we use book values rather than market values when we compute return equity and return investment capital? Anybody would try? Yes. So that's the actual capital being used. So why don't we do that with cost of capital? Because that's because on cost of capital, uh, for an investor, you are seeing how much return the investor gets here. You're going down a dangerous road, right? Remember what we said about every DCF? What's every DCF? It's an acquisition, exercise and acquisition valuation. A cost of capital use market value weights because if you try to, try to go buy Tesla today, you can't play book equity. So the reason we use market values in the cost of capital is it's an acquisition cost. The reason we use book values is because we want to get a sense of what you're actually made on your projects. In fact, let me cut to the chase. If I did market values right and I truly restated your, your, your capital to market value, you know what your return on capital should be? What's the definition of market value? You're earning your cost of capital. The return capital of every company should end up close or equal to its cost. This is why I don't like fair value accounting. They're taking away ammunition I need to decide whether a company is taking good projects. Every project, good and bad, will have a return capital equal to the cost of capital. How is that useful? I'd rather that you told me what was actually invested. I might have still have to do inflation adjustments on it and what you're making because it gives me a better measure of what this company has actually earned on its projects. We'll come back and talk about the limitations of return on invested capital, but that's why we use book values. We're trying to get a better sense of what did you actually invest? What did you actually make? So when you look at return on capital, that's basically what you're focusing on. And here's how having a higher return on capital will help you. For a given reinvestment rate, having a higher return on capital will give you a higher growth rate. So if you have two companies reinvesting the same amount, the company with a higher return on capital is going to have a higher growth rate. Conversely, if you both grow at the same rate, having a higher return on capital will allow you to give back more cash flows because you need to reinvest less. It becomes the metric that's going to drive whether your growth is valuable, zero value, or negative value, because that return on capital is going to determine how much you reinvest. So let's close this section by actually bringing these numbers together. The late 90s, one of the stars of the market was Cisco. Cisco went from a market cap of 4 billion in 1990 to a market cap of 400 billion 10 years later, 1999. And what made Cisco unique, and if you remember, is the acquisitions they did along the way. So we talked about how acquisition should be part of net capex. 
So when I include the acquisition, their reinvestment rate was 107%. If you go back in the slides, you can see what my reinvestment was the R&D and the acquisitions. So then half the game is done, right? They're reinvesting a lot. But what made Cisco so impressive as a company in 1999 was the return on invested capital was 34%. They were pulling off a trick that very few companies can pull off, which is reinvest a lot and reinvest well at the same time. Now you can see why they were a star company. You take the product of those two numbers, the expected growth rate again is 36%. And here is a cautionary note. In 2000, they were a star company. That's what the numbers look like. They grew through acquisitions. The next decade, Cisco continued to have this high reinvestment rate. They continued to do acquisitions. You know what number changed? This 34% return on capital dropped about 8 to 9%. Their growth rate went from you know, being double digits to single digit growth rate. And people said, what happened? Yeah, they scaled up at a 400 million. They were doing bigger acquisitions. Their acquisitions were not as good. And this is, I think, one reason when you compute your return on capital and reinvestment rate from the past, you should stop and ask, has the world changed for my company? Has the business changed? Because your job is to forecast the future, not extrapolate the past. And in this case, the, the, the peril with Cisco was things were starting to work against. It was a much bigger company. What does that mean? Instead of doing 10 acquisitions, you had to do 50 acquisitions or do 10 bigger acquisitions. And already your game gets more difficult to win. You're coming off a dot-com boost. You now have an economy that's slowing down. Things both within the sector and outside the sector were changing. And if I'd used the 34% growth rate for Cisco, I'd have found them to be fairly valued in 99. And three years later, I'd have looked back and said, what did I get wrong? And what I'd have got wrong is the assumption that the return on capital can stay at historic numbers. So here's the bottom line. In each of these approaches to sustainable growth, the key drivers that are counting return, right? ROE. And the number terrifies me, I'll be quite honest. All of those accounting returns. And here's what terrifies me about it. the numerator is an accounting number, right? Earnings, net income, operating income. And the denominator is also an accounting number. You think, so what? Everything accountants do to, I don't want to use the word screw up, but to change those numbers will affect your return on investment capital. That's why we went back and capitalized R&D and capitalized leases because we wanted to make them part of investment capital because accountants are not doing it right. If that were the only fixes, life would be simple. So if, if, you, if you could trust accountants to just be okay, those are the two things that they were messing up. Fixing it wouldn't be a problem, right? But here are the things that can really make your accounting return on capital go off, go off the track. Let's say you have a company that's taken a bad investment. You know what I mean by bad investment? They invested, I'll give you an example. I think it was uh, Conoco had this $50 billion investment they made at the peak of oil prices in 2015. That five years later, you could look back and say, that was a terrible investment. You're making only a 3% return. Everybody knew they had made a mistake. And when everybody knows you made a mistake, you know what accountants are allowed to do, right? You made a big mistake. What do they do? Right. They take a restructuring charge or a write-off. Then you can see, I'm not, I'm not picking on accountants for doing it. They're doing the right thing. They, let's say you write off 35 billion. You know how you write it off. You write off enough so you're earning a decent return on the projects. So you've written off 35 billion for $50 billion mistake. You're saying, of course, I can see them writing it off. Let's say it's two years later. You're looking at Conoco's balance. You're going to take the book equity, the book debt, the cash. You're going to divide by the, the operating income by that number. And you know what you're going to include? This is a great company. They're making a 12% return. And what you'd be missing is the 35 billion that got taken off the denominator because of screw-ups. If you truly wanted to get a sense of what Conoco is earning on its project, you know what you need to do? You need to reverse the restructuring charge, not just this year, but going back in time. Now do you see why getting return on investment capital can be a nightmare? In a sense, you're going back and reversing everything accountants do. I wish there were a button you could hit. You know, hit the button and everything gets reversed and capital like you re, re, re That's what you would need to get return on investment capital. I don't know how many of you have trouble sleeping. 
But if you do, I have what? a fix. About 15 years ago, I wrote a paper on measuring accounting returns. Incredibly boring paper. <laughs> but if you, it was all about, so there's nothing technically difficult about the paper. It's about things like, what do you do about restructuring charges? What about goodwill? Goodwill is a nightmare in an accounting return capital. And here's why. What is goodwill? It's actually what you pay over and above the book value to buy a growth company, right? So what, because it's for growth assets, accountants often take it out of invested capital and say, hey, I can't count it because I'm not making money on it. But goodwill can reflect future growth. It can also reflect stupidity. You overpay for a company, where does it go? It goes into goodwill. So a few years ago, I proposed to accounting rule writers that goodwill on a balance sheet would be broken down to stupid goodwill and smart goodwill. They never took my advice. But the stupid goodwill, I would leave as part of invested capital because, and in a sense, in hindsight, we get it, right? Because when you get goodwill impairment, it's accounting saying that was stupid goodwill. There are a lot of these measurement issues. And the reason I say that is return investment capital has become this magic bullet at consulting firms. What's your ROIC? You tell me what the ROIC is, I can tell you everything about your company. And I'm, you know, I compute the return investment capital for every publicly traded company. I'm intimately aware of both its strengths, which is you get this metric, you can look across companies and its weaknesses. And I would strongly recommend that you look at the dark underbelly of return on investment capital, because sometimes you can have a company with a return on investment capital of 35%, when once you start to dig deeper, you really realize it's not a great company. Or a company with a return on investment capital of 5%, well, you realize being unfair to the company because it's a young company, an infrastructure company, and not factoring in things that can happen in the future. So I'm not saying don't compute it, but I'm saying don't get dependent on it to read too much into it without looking at what goes into it. So that's sustainable growth. Sustainable growth, as I said, works if you assume that things are in steady state. So if you think in terms of the life cycle, you know where sustainable growth will work for you in running a company, right? Mature companies that have hit a steady state. You know how many companies that are like that in the world today? I can think of too many. Businesses are getting disrupted. Even companies like Coca-Cola and Kraft Times, you know the under, underlying economics are changing. So you keep the sustainable growth equations in mind because they will come in useful when we get to steady state, which in our DCF is going to be terminal value. But when you're projecting our growth for the next 10 years, it's not a great indicator for future growth. And one reason, of course, is when you have this efficiency component, it's going to allow you to grow faster because now you're improving the return on capital. By improving the return on capital, you're able to increase your growth rate. So when you have a company with a low return on capital, it's improving its returns by cutting costs. You can get free growth for a while, as it, and the worse your existing return on capital, the greater the potential for doing it, right? I mean, if you have 30% return on capital, don't put efficiency growth. You're already pretty efficient. But if you have a 3% return on capital, you could potentially argue that this company should be able to improve its return on capital and through that get growth. So I'm going to set up an example. I'm going to show you five companies, all of whom have the same growth rate. But I want you to think like an investor slash appraiser slash analyst and rank these companies from best growth to worst growth. Let's, in fact, start with the worst growth. These companies all have 10% growth rates, but the way they get there is different. It's a function of how much they reinvest as well as how much the return on investment capital is changing. So I'm gonna look at these five companies and tell me which company is the company that has the worst growth. Worst growth in the sense of companies growing could actually be destroyed by Which is the worst company? I heard somebody say five. Five. With five, you get no long-term growth. Basically, they're reinvesting nothing, but they're getting efficiency. It's good, right? You're getting one year of growth rate, but that growth is still good growth. Is there a company where you can't even say any good things about the growth rate? What is it about three that should terrify you? They're reinvesting a huge amount, 200%. They're earning a 5% return on capital. So they're going to keep growing at 10% you know, every year. And every year they grow, they're going to get less value. You see why? Because that 5% that they're earning is less than their cost of capital. Three is the worst company. 
which one is the best? It's tricky. Which which one would you? If you're a long let, let me separate. If you're a long term investor, which of these five companies would you latch on to as your best one? One, one because it is earning the highest return, so you're going to get a lot lot of cash flows. Eighty percent of the cash flows can be returned. They can make them. Yeah. The reason I said long term investor is if you're a short term investor. The company that gives you growth with no effort at all is actually company fuck. You're going to get the 10% growth rate, but then you're done. All I'm saying is when you look at the growth for your company, then you're going to see a company, 15% growth. Break it down. How much is coming from improving returns? How much is coming from reinvestment? Because this is your starting point for assessing. Is this the kind of company where growth is going to add value, destroy value, or do nothing? So I'm going to end the growth se session section by focusing in on the most generic way of thinking about growth. As I said, very few companies have returns on capital that are sustainable, reinvestment rates that are not going to change. Many of you are earning money losing companies, right? None of the equations we talked about are going to work for you. Your accounting return is going to be negative. Your reinvestment rate is going to be negative. So this is the most generic way of thinking about growth. And it's built around three inputs that if you use my FCFF simple games of spreadsheet, become the three levers used to estimate cash flows. And here's the three-step process. You're looking at a company where margins are changing. If your margins are changing, guess what? You've got to climb the income statement to revenues and project revenues first. So you start with revenues, you project revenue growth. What's going to drive that growth rate? You're going to look at the size of the market, your market share, what we'll think about your company, its competitive advantages. We'll talk about the pieces that go to the puzzle. But the first piece of the puzzle is revenues and revenue. Second step, I'm going to stop and ask you, well, your margins right now are crappy. What will your target margins look like? You're saying, what's a target margin? It's what you think your company will earn as a margin after it's gone through its growth phase. So you can't use any more excuses of, infra of you know, it's infrastructure, economies of scale. You run them all through. And we'll talk about the economics that are determined. And the reason I want to emphasize the economics is I'm going to ask you a very simplistic question after I list all three. So you've got growth, revenue growth, you've got margins. Margins times revenues give you operating income. And then you need to subtract out reinvestment. Right? And now that your margins are changing, your reinvestment cannot be connected to operating income like it was in the sustainable growth. It's got to be connected to revenues. And the way I'm going to estimate it is I'm going to figure out how much you need to reinvest given how much you want to grow your revenues. So the sales to capital ratio becomes a proxy for how efficiently you're growing. The more efficiently you're growing, the higher that number is going to be. The less efficiently you're growing, the lower that number is going to be. Revenue growth, tar I'm going to argue with those three inputs. You can move the world. You can give me any kind of company with those three inputs, I should be able to value the company. So with each input, I'm going to let you pick whether you want a higher or lower number for your company, right? So go along. It's a simplistic exercise. If you have a company you want me to value, and you want a high value for your company, I'm going to ask you, what kind of revenue growth does your company have? Will you give me a high number or a low number? Unconstrained by common sense, you know, I want an 80% growth rate. Okay? Next, when I get to a target margin, and you want to increase your value, do you want a high target margin or a low target margin? Like 60% margin, 100% revenue growth. Then when I asked you, well, with your sales to capital ratio, do you want to reinvest a lot or not reinvest very much? I, said, I don't I want to get away with reinvesting nothing. A sales to capital ratio, that's infinite. So obviously, well, we can pick whatever number you want. You can make any company worth any number you want. You want to make Tesla four. Now what, what was Kathy Wood's latest estimate for Tesla? I think $4,000 per share, $4 trillion. It's no problem. Just use a higher revenue growth, a higher margin, and a higher and a high sales to capital ratio. So I'm going to introduce some economics I want you to think about. And I hope you picked a company because as I go through these economics, I want you to start thinking about what you'll be thinking about with your company and making assessments. Let's start with the revenue growth estimate. When you think about revenue growth for your company, the first assessment you've got to make is how big is the market? I'm going out. And already you can see that if you produce a niche pro product or a product in a country that's a small market, you have no way of growing, you're already constrained how much revenue growth you can have, right? So what's the total market? 
In the language of Silicon Valley, this has become what's called total addressable market or TAF. So I'm gonna talk about how companies have gone crazy with that number, but that basically, if you're doing it right, is an assessment of how big is the market I'm going to. But your revenues is not the total market, right? It's your market share of that market. And what's going to go into that assessment? You're gonna make a judgment of, is my company so much better than the competition? What are the barriers to entry? What are the economics of the business? Is it a splintered business? Some businesses end up with 100 companies. Some end up dominated by three or four companies. Those go into market share. I'm not saying it's easy, but that's your starting point for growth. Rate. So don't, don't sit there with the growth rate. Should I use 35 or 40%? It's kind of a meaningless number. You want to start by looking at the size. So I'm going to use an example to illustrate this process. The example I'm going to use is the valuation I did for Airbnb. And I picked Airbnb because you're all familiar with what the company does. And this was the valuation I did at the time of their IPO. So the first question I had to ask was, how big is the market for what Airbnb does? You know, the first reaction I get is, nobody's ever done what Airbnb does. But is that true? Did you travel before 2008? Did you stay in places in cities you didn't know? Yeah, right? We call those places hotels, and they've been around for as long as human beings have been on the face of the earth. So the place I started was with the hotel business. The advantage with the hotel business is most of the big hotel companies are publicly traded. You know why that's an advantage? I could look at their revenues. And I looked at the sum of the revenues across all hotels globally. And in 2018, that number was about $660 billion. Collectively, hotels around the world collected about $660 billion in revenues. Do you think that's the maximum market size for Airbnb? Well, if I'd been valuing Airbnb in 2012, that would have been a market size. But in 2013, I valued Uber, and I did exactly what I did here. And there, I described my market as the car service business. It's a much more difficult business to get the total numbers of. You know what? Who dominated that business before Uber came along? Taxi cab companies. Or, so I had to actually go city by city, adding up numbers from tax. It was a nightmare. You say, why don't you look it up on Google? Nobody had done it before. And I came up with a number of 100 billion, which I think was a pretty good estimate of the car service market then. I based my original Uber valuation on that 100 billion. I'll come back and talk about the pushback I got on it. But one of the people who pushed back was a guy called Bill Gurley. You know what a bill? Partner at Benchmark Capital, the VC. Benchmark Capital was one of the first investors in Uber. He was on the board of directors of Uber in 2013. He was rumored to be the person closest to Travis Lackman, who was the CEO of Uber at that time. So let me start with an easy question. Does Bill Gurley know more about Uber than I do? Of course. And his pushback was, you're missing the point that Uber is changing the car service business. In what way? That people were doing who would not have used a taxi cab were now using car services. And he was absolutely right. My youngest son, for the long time, I think he's still on my credit card when he uses Uber. And there's some Saturday nights I look down at my phone and I see seven Uber charges over the course of two hours. <laughs> now, I think personally, he's taking an Uber from the bedroom to the bathroom. And take me to the um, Basically because it's become so easy, right? You call an Uber, two blocks, not a big deal. So there are people entering the car service. And there are parts of the country, San Francisco is the best example because ride-sharing companies have been there the longest, where people don't buy cars anymore. Why pay for a car and insurance when they have three ride-sharing companies right there, right? Call them, they're right there two minutes later. I missed that in 2013. And I wrote a mea culpa saying, I should have seen that coming. The only thing you can do is you can't go back and fix your 2013 valuation. But the thing I learned from that is you can change the size of a business if you change behavior. I had to make a judgment on what that change will be. And I, you know, later when I do my Airbnb valuation, you'll see, you know, I actually projected that they'd be able to double the size of the market because people who might not have gone to a hotel are now much more likely to go stay in Airbnb because you're taking your family, it's so expensive to get a hotel. You, know, you might use an Airbnb instead. 
So your total market is going to be a starting point, but what that market will look like might depend on what behavior changes come in. And if you look at the breakdown of the existing market, it's concentrated. There's something about the hospitality business that drives to consolidation. Where will that play out? When I give a market share for Airbnb, I'm going to reflect the fact that you'll have a, you know, a few big players. Why? Because you don't want to go stay at some no-name hotel because you have no idea what you will find there, right? You're part of a, a program with a hotel. Now I'm on the, the Marriott. And so I tend to look for a Marriott first before I look for other hotels. So I'm learning something about the business. But then if you think about it, Airbnb is in the hospitality business, but it's not really like a hotel company, right? Hotel companies are constrained because they have physical infrastructure. And Marriott has revenues, and it's the largest hotel company, about $25 billion. So I said, look, I'm going to look at somebody else who's playing in the hospitality business who does something more similar to Airbnb, which acts as an intermediate. And the two companies are big. You've probably heard of a lot. One is Expedia that's been around a long time. The other is Booking.com. Again, when people say nobody's done what Airbnb has done, hey, Booking.com and Expedia have been doing it for longer. They just connected you to hotels. And it gives you a different perspective of the business. In the year that I looked at, uh, at, 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 um, at, uh, at Booking and Expedia, Booking had revenue, had gross bookings of about $200 billion. There's a lot of money that flows through. You see, that's a lot of money. Remember, they don't get to keep the entire $200 billion. They get a slice of that. And that's the Airbnb business. They'll have a big gross booking, but their slice is going to be the 14% of whatever they keep. So that was my assessment of a total addressable market. Now, I told you Silicon Valley has learned to play this game. So if you look at the prospectus for Airbnb, they give their own assessments of what they call the TAM. They don't even expand it because it leaves it mysterious for you. And their estimate for the total addressable market was about one point. They then create these sub acronyms, serviceable, addressable, total addressable. But basically, I wasn't. I was okay with their initial estimate, one point two to one point five trillion. But they said the other stuff we will do will increase the market to three point four trillion. Say what other stuff? You know, one of the things that Airbnb promoted for a while is that hosts would offer you other services, like what if you want to get a you know guided tour of the city for one hundred and fifty. I would never use a host of an Airbnb to be my travel guide because who knows what this guy is going to put me in and where he's going to take me or she's going to, but they, you know, but they said all this other stuff and they've left it kind of unspecified will take me from 1.5 trillion to 3.4 trillion. That's a lot of money. One, you know, and this is part of the problem is when you make up total addressable markets, you can basically make up any number you want. When we value Uber, when talk about my total addressable market, which is too small, but in their Uber IP, in the Uber IPO, do you know what they estimated as their total addressable market? $5.2 trillion. The entire automobile business is about a trillion and a half. So how do they get to 5.2 trillion? They added up everything everybody spent on cars, maintaining cars, servicing cars. They added mass transit and it's transportation, you know, we'll call it a total addressable market. It actually makes no sense for a car service company to count that all. But you know why companies like to give you trillions as total addressable markets? Because as an investor, what do you think? We're two trillion. Yeah. Now, this is why when people say, well, Tesla can have two trillion in revenue. So what have you been drinking? We can debate how successful Tesla will be, but the largest automobile company is 300 billion. You have two trillion. There's something wrong with your story. You say, AI will do it for you. The collective AI business is probably 100 billion. Robots will do it for you. Another 200 billion. 100% market share of both. You're still at 600 billion. Automated driving. We have a problem here. Because automated driving is your way of adding another 100 billion revenues. We need fewer cars on the roads, right? Because remember, the cars that 80% of cars right now, where are they? They're in a parking lot parked waiting for the owner to come back. Everybody used to do automated driving, you need half as many cars. Automated driving will actually reduce your total revenue one. So when you think about total addressable market, you're going to make some judgment calls. 
And one of the things you got to watch out for in Silicon Valley prospectus is they now have this loop where essentially they argue that this, they call this the network loop. Basically, as companies get bigger, they're going to get bigger. Basically, that, you know, and, there, and the way to think about this is if you want to list your apartment on an intermediary service, let's say there are five competitors to Airbnb, Airbnb is the biggest, and you've got VRBO, and you've got three other no names. Guess which one you're going to go listed on? You're going to go listed on the biggest one because that's where. So it's almost as you get bigger, it creates this networking benefit where it gets easier for you to get bigger and the other services disappear. It's already happened with intermediaries. It's basically Airbnb or VRBO because every smaller player has disappeared because you're not going to list that. Nobody's going to find you. Go ahead. Somebody had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, also like uh, assuming say, Uber's trillion dollar market is realized. Assuming yeah. That, that would be the gross billing. So remember, you get to keep 20%, and we're assuming the 20% stays the same. So it'll make the billion, trillion. So you can't mistake gross bookings for revenues. Your revenues will be 20% of that. And then from that 200 billion, then you got to subtract out expenses. Yeah. Wouldn't that, like, contrast Tesla's uh, total addressable market? Because those two are running in Well, not necessarily, right? The Tesla advocates would say our automated driving is what's going to, so we're going to provide the cars that you can use for automated driving. So if Uber wants to compete in this car and in this game and use automated driving cars, they'll have to buy Teslas. But you're right, you're raising an interesting question of what exactly is Tesla's game in automated driving? I don't think they want to be an Uber. Very capital intensive, very logistic driven business. Not capital intensive, very logistics, but it'll be capital intensive if they do it because they now have to make the cars and use them as their. I don't think Tesla has the stomach for it. So they're going to be doing something in the automated driving space, even if you accept the premise that they have the best cars in terms of automated driving. You have to then ask, you know, will they be selling the cars to Ubers and the Lyfts of the world? That's very similar to the business with the old car rental companies like Hertz and Avis. The way you do it is you have to offer a discount. You got to get them to buy thousands of cars. It's not easy. And essentially, I'm willing to listen, but these people who keep adding a trillion dollars to revenue saying it's automated traffic, I don't quite, quite get how you get there. Right? There is no business out there with that much revenue. So that's the first stop. Right? So stop, take the second look at margins. So I said, left to yourselves, you want to use. 60% margins, right? But the problem is you pick a business, your margins are determined by the economics of the business. You, know, you hear this word unit economics, a great deal with the other companies. You know what unit economics is? It's a fancy way of saying that extra unit that you sell, how much of the revenues from that unit become profits? So what's it going to be a function of? What does it cost you to make that extra unit? The lesser the cost, the better the unit economics. Software companies have great unit economics. Why the extra unit of software that Microsoft sells cost them absolutely nothing to make. So when you look at the operating margins for software companies, you're going to see 35, 40, 45%. Even badly run software companies can have 30% margins. A manufacturing company can almost never have 30% operating margins. Why? Because you've got to make a car to sell it. I don't care how efficient you are. In fact, in 2021, which is kind of peak year for Tesla, they had, they had gross margins of about 26%. And people said, hey, that's my operating margin, 26%. That's your gross margin. There's many a slip between the gross and the operating margin, right? You've got other operating expenses. So if your gross margins are 26%, your operating margins are going to be like 12%, 14%. That's a unit economics model. And already you can see when you get to this choice for your company, you have to say, what are the unit economics? What does my company do? It'll also depend on how competitive this business is. Let's say it costs you almost nothing to make a product. Your first reaction is, I'll have great margins. But what if it costs almost nothing to make for everybody in your business? You have 10 players in the business. It's costing them almost nothing to make a semiconductor chip. And you've seen that the cost drop. If you have competition, you know what's going to change, right? You're going to start knocking prices down. So the second thing you have to bring in is, am I in a very competitive business? Because there, even though the unit economics are great, you might not get great margins. 
And finally, you have to think about what kind of business model is my company adopting. Sometimes you can do a trade-off where you go for higher margins and lower growth, a niche business going after a discretionary product. Life is full of trade-offs. And when you think about margins, those trade-offs have to come into play. So I've often heard people say, you know, if your costs coming down, margin should go up. You know, that's an incomplete story. You now have to tell me why as costs are coming down, people are not competing and pushing prices down because then you're going to have costs come down and margins stay low. So with Airbnb, I projected out 156 billion in gross bookings. I thought I was being pretty upbeat. The 156 billion would make them about 10% of the money spent in the hospitality business. And remember the 155 billion is gross booking. Their revenues are about 14%. That comes from their business model. So right now, when you rent on Airbnb, 14% of, of whatever you pay goes to Airbnb. I make the assumption that 14% is going to stay intact. And there again, you might push back and say, maybe if I have competition, the 14% could become 12%. This is where the networking benefits help. You put, you're basically, as you get larger, you're going to have little or no competition. You're going to end up converging on the 14%. In terms of margins, they start at minus 10%. They're a money losing company, but over time, I'm assuming the margins will converge around 25% because in, as an intermediate, the unit economics work in your favor. And to get a sense of why, whether I should use 25 or 35 or 45 or 50%, I looked at booking.com, which I think was the closest analog that I could think of from the 20th century in terms of what they did. And their margins, we're actually 35.48% in 2009. Remember, by the time I did this, it was November of 2020. At the peak of COVID, the margins had not dropped. So I think the 25% margin, you can push back to maybe it should be 30, but it's not going to be 60% margin. They're clearly costs associated. In the business. I think, why are Expedia's margins low? Actually, I was puzzled when I first saw them. You know what Expedia does that Booking.com does not do that pushes down their margins? They actually buy blocks of rooms from hotels and resell them. In other words, they actually invest capital. It's a lower margin business. It allows them to report higher revenues, but that's what I mean by trade-offs. If you want to go into that business, I'm okay, but then don't give me these 25 or 30% margins in that business. Which brings me to the sales to invested capital. Here again, left to your own device, and you're going to pick a really high number, right? 20. I get $20 of revenue for every lot of capital. But part of this is going to be determined by the business here. If you're in a business that you need to build factories and plant and equipment, that's going to go in. You'll have to consider whether as you get bigger, that number is going to, you're going to get more. So depending on the business, in some businesses, as you get bigger, you're able to more efficiently deploy the additional capital. Your sales to capital ratio will rise. In some businesses, it might drop. So you, you can change the sales to capital ratio over time. And my spreadsheet, I allow you three shots in. One is what's it going to be next year, near term? What's it going to be between years two and five? What's it going to be after year five? Allowing you three chances that my sales and capital ratio could change over time. But here's something you want to think about when you think about sales and capital ratio. If you have a manufacturing company that has excess capacity, 50% excess capacity, and you're giving them growth for the next five years, you might be able to do it with almost no capital invested, right? You're existing. So if you look at my Tesla valuation, and this might be a good time to go back and look at that week one valuation, because at that time you said, where did that sales to capital ratio come from? Here's the story. The Shanghai plant had just been completed when I did that valuation. They were using about 10% of it. And I said, I'm giving them growth for the next five years, but a big chunk of that growth come, can come from all these plants that have come on to production just now. So I gave them a high sales to capital ratio, not forever, because clearly that capacity is not going to last forever. And then as they, that, that capacity got used up, I shifted to a sales to capital ratio for the industry. So here again, you can look at what's typical for the industry and make your judgment. So as you do this for your company, factor that in. So to complete my Airbnb story, they have no excess capacity, right? It's an intermediary business. Their existing sales to capital ratio is about 1.98. For every dollar of capital, they're generating a dollar ninety-eight in revenue. So I took their total revenues divided by total invested capital. Same invested capital that we use for ROIC, 
So do all the things we did there, capitalize R&D, capitalize brand name advertising, get a measure of sales for investment capital. They're already, their economies of scale, no, they're already there because Airbnb is already a pretty big player in the intermediation business. I am assuming that they've hit kind of a steady state. Now I could be wrong. Maybe they can get more efficient over time in terms of additional capital invested. I don't think so. But in that story, you can raise the sales to capital ratio over time saying they're going to see, be able to get more efficient of the capital deployment. You cannot run away from the business you're in. So if you have a business where the sales to capital ratio is two and you give me a sales to capital ratio of 10, I'm going to push back and say, tell me what's different. And maybe you have a really unique story for your company about how it's changing the business model. But take a look at those industry averages because at least you get a sense of the reason sales to capital is so difficult to work with is if I asked you what a typical sales to capital ratio for a company is, you say, I have no idea. Return on capital, you have a chance at least 15%, 12%. So that's part of the reason I want you to scan the data. So when somebody makes up a sales to capital ratio that you know is out of the norm, you can push back and say, that number looks off 0.25. Oh, that number looks great. But having that perspective is key in making your estimation. Which brings me to the big number in every DCF language. The big enchilada in every DCF is the terminal value. It's the number where the most mischief is created in valuation. So I want to talk about why we need that number. First, the value of an asset is the present value of its expected cash flows over its lifetime, right? Which if you have a five-year asset, not a big deal, 10-year asset maybe, but if you have a company that in theory could last forever, you can't do that. So what do you do? You stop at a point in time and you estimate a terminal value. Everybody does that. So let's talk about the terminal value calculation because I'm going to give you three ways of getting the terminal value. And one of them is a terrible way, but 80% of DCFs use it, especially banking DCFs. And I want you to isolate that and talk about why it matters. First is, you can do a liquidation valuation. So you run your company for 10 years, you liquidate the company, you sell off. The, so think of it as an e, basically you're selling everything on eBay at the end of your time. So you liquidate Disney, and you sell off the, the Peter Pan ride in pieces. I'm sure the collectors will collect it. Liquidation value. Perfectly okay, right? When is that appropriate? When you have a declining or a dying business, you can say, you know what? At the end of your 10th, there's really going to be no demand for this business. I'm going to liquidate it. Liquidation value is okay. You seldom see it used with publicly traded companies because it, it is a very negative perspective on the company. The second is a going concern. What does that mean? You get to your 10. Your company doesn't stop. It keeps going. But then you got to tell me what growth rate you will have in perpetuity or over the next 50 years. And I compute a present value. That's what you see in DCF, at least in the most commonly applied version of the DCF, growth rate in perpetuity. We'll come back and talk about what that growth rate is. It's a going concern. That's it if you want it to last forever. Is it okay if I get to year 10 and rather than assuming that things will last forever, I assume only 15 years, absolutely okay. I don't see why people don't use it more. What you then you will have is a growing annuity for the next 15 years. We know how to compute the present value of it. The fact that people don't use it doesn't mean you cannot do it. And then there's a final approach, which is where 80% of banking, 90% of banking DCFs do, which is you get to year 10. And here's what you do. You take the EBITDA in your 10 and you apply a multiple. Where do you get the multiple? By looking at publicly traded companies in space. Say eight times EBITDA. And this is the one where you cannot do terminal value in a DCF. You see what? You made the biggest number in your intrinsic valuation into a pricing. It's a forward pricing, right? Let's face it. Everything else in your DCF is kind of secondary to eight times EBITDA. I use 10 times EBITDA. You know why bankers like it, right? It's easy to adjust your terminal value by changing the eight to 10 or eight to six, depending on what your bias is. It's a terrible way to do it. See, why do people keep doing it? Because the banker's job is a pricing job. I don't even know why they waste their time on DCFs, to be quite honest. I'd be much better, or I, I think we'd all be better off if a banker said, we're going to stop doing DCFs, we're just going to do pricing, 
We're not going to play this game of projecting cash flow the next year. We'll use a forward pricing for this company because numbers are not settled in. Much more respect for banking pricing, if that's what it was called. But to take a DCF and make your biggest number into a pricing misses the point of intrinsic value. It's about cash flows, growth, and risk. And pricing has nothing to do with it. So with that lead in, let's talk about this going concern assumption because liquidation valuation, pretty, pretty straightforward. You go through the assets, what will I get? Pricing you cannot use. Let's talk about the going concern assumption. Let's take the perpetual version because that's what we see most often. Your cash flow one year after your last year. So the mechanical detail to get a terminal value in your 10, I always need cash flows in your 11. Why? Because that's the way present value equations work. You need the cash flow one year after divided by R minus G. Now, do you see why this is the most dangerous equation in finance? Let's say you're, you're valuing a company. You come up with too low a number. Don't waste your time changing the growth rate in year one or year two. Here's what you need to do. Go to the terminal value, hold all its constant, and just change the G and move it towards the R, right? You know where you're going to go. Call these buzz light year valuations. You're going to go to infinity and beyond. You see, well, as G goes towards R, your terminal value is going to go to infinity. And then when G exceeds R, you've gone beyond. I don't even know what that beyond looks like, but I don't want to be there with you. So let's put some limits on this G. First, remember that this growth rate is a growth rate forever. You can't let your company grow at a rate higher than the growth rate forever. One of the most common pushbacks I got in the Tesla valuation was that I was assuming a growth rate in perpetuity of only 4%. Tesla is a special company. I don't care how special you are. There's a mathematical problem with letting you grow more than 4% a year in US dollar terms because you will become the economy. Then what? Interplanetary travel, okay. Tesla, you said maybe they'll put the Teslas and SpaceXs and send them off to Mars. Who that will buy the cars on Mars, I don't know. But this is a mathematical constraint. It's not a finance issue or econ. I'm not assuming it. The math works against you. The growth rate in perpetuity cannot exceed the growth rate of the economy. Keyword is cannot. Can it be low? Yeah, in fact, you could argue that mature companies should have a growth rate lower than the growth rate of the economy. And here's why. The economy is composed of both high growth firms and mature firms, right? If I let every mature firm grow, grow the growth rate of the economy, then how the heck do I have excess growth for the high growth firms? So the growth rate can be lower. Can it be zero? Absolutely, you can have a growth company. Can it be negative? How many times have you seen a DCF with negative growth rates in perpetuity? I can never have, I don't understand this. The reason I don't do some companies shrink up, you're a tobacco company. What the heck are you doing putting in a 3% growth rate in perpetuity? Wouldn't it be more realistic to put in a minus 3% growth rate forever? What does that do? Your company will peak in year 10 and then it'll shrink over time gradually to become nothing. Fossil fuel companies, declining or dying businesses, open that option. And final point is consistency. People often, should I use a, in fact, I get this email at least once a day. The people say, I've done my evaluation. I'm using a 2% growth rate. This is from somebody valuing an Iranian company. And of course, Iran getting cash flows, your inflation is 20%. He said, I'm using a 3% growth rate and I'm getting a really low value. And I said, are you surprised? Your discount rate is 23%. You put in a 3% growth rate. You're putting in a real growth rate. Your value is going to implode. If you're doing everything in normal terms, which I assume you are, by the time you get to this point, your growth rate should also be a nominal growth rate. You're doing everything in rupiah. Your growth rate has to be in rupiah. The consistency issue comes in. So I'm going to give you the proxy that I use for my growth rate thread. And here's where I come up with the proxy. Do you really want to be estimating the nominal growth rate in the global economy forever starting in year 2032? I don't even know. I can't even estimate the normal growth in the global economy next year. What the heck am I doing projecting what the... So I'm looking for a proxy. And I, you're saying, why don't you ask macroeconomists? What the heck do they know? They tell you two years after a recession, there was a recession two years ago. and said, thank you for letting me know now. That's how long it takes NBER to classify a recession. 
So I'm going to use my risk-free rate as my growth rate forever. And people say, what's one got to do with the other? What goes into a nominal risk-free rate? What are the two components? There's an expected inflation and an expected real interest rate, right? What goes in a nominal growth rate in the economy? Expected inflation and an expected real growth. I'm going to make a statement that I'll back it up with that bricks, that in the long term, your expected real interest rate and the expected real growth rate have to be close to each other. It might not be exactly, here's why. If I promise an expected real interest rate of 3% and the economy is growing at only 1%, I'm going to have a problem. Because remember, I have to deliver 3% more in goods and services. If your economy is not growing at that rate, I mean, I'm going to default. The whole thing's going to blow up. It is conceivable that your real growth can be higher than your real risk free rate, but not forever. Something's got to adjust. You think that's hypothetical? Is it true? So, one, one thing I did was I actually went back over time and I got the 10 year bond rate at the start of each period. The inflation rate and the real GDP growth in each period. If you add the inflation rate to the real GDP growth, I get the nominal GDP growth. I will make this bet, and you're willing to take it up. I will wager that the 10-year T-bond rate has been a better predictor of US economic nominal growth over the following decade than any economist or group of economists prediction you have on the growth rate. Because over time, you see that when T-bond rates are high, nominal growth is high, because the same forces drive growth. And here's my other rationale. Even if you don't buy into anything I've said, say you say, I think the risk free rate is too low, which is what a lot of people said for the last decade. You know what the best thing to do is keep your growth rate at that level because you're making the same mistake that in both your numerator and your denominator. If you let the growth rate be the growth rate of the economy, and let's say in 2019, you thought it was going to be 4%, but you continue to use a 1.5% T-bond rate, you're being internally inconsistent. So even if you believe nothing of what I've said, there's an advantage to locking in your growth rate to your risk-free rate. Because then if you screw up on one, you're going to screw up on the other, and there are one is in the numerator, the other is the denominator, they're going to cancel out. Many of the analysts have found companies to be overvalued in the last decade. Here's what they were doing. They were using nominal growth rates of the US economy from history, three, four, five percent. They were using T-bond rates actually as they were, one, one and a half, two percent. And then they were throwing up their hands saying, what's going on? Why am I getting these high values? Because you're making assumptions about the economy that are actually different within your own equation. Your numerator is assuming one type of economy, your denominator is not. So you can either fix the risk-free rate by making it some kind of a normalized risk-free rate, or you can fix the growth rate by setting it equal to the risk-free rate. But what you cannot do is have different assumptions driving it. So I will leave you with that thought. And if you get a chance, open up the FCFF simple Ginsu spreadsheet and at least look at revenue growth margins and reinvestment and sales of capital and start thinking about your company. <laughs> You're in the break. Thank you.